Hello and welcome to AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. I'm your host, John S. Today we'll be speaking with John Stewart, a lecturer in cultural history, a public speaker on secular recovery, and whose blog best describes our conversation. Leaving AA, staying sober, new perspectives on recovery. Well, John, uh, thank you for joining us. This is going to be really interesting for me uh, to speak with you. It's my first time talking to somebody who's actually left AA, yep. um, and I'm interested in in learning about your experience and what you're doing today. And I always start by just asking the person to kind of give us a little bit of background on you know their drinking and drugging or whatever got them into recovery to begin with. You want to kind of go into that? Sure, absolutely. Um, I... Uh, I'm just a sort of a classic alcoholic, really. I think I, I, I identified very strongly with what I heard shared at meetings. Um, I suppose I'd always had that hole in the soul that they talk about, and um, the the I'd always felt sort of restless, irritable, and discontent. And from my very first drink, I felt like a light had been switched on. And that it was doing something that I couldn't do for myself. And then I was a kind of a fairly regular drinker. I, I always remember being either afraid or drunk. And so I didn't like being anxious. And I, I quite enjoyed being not drunk drunk, but sort of manageably medicating. And um, mm-hmm. I ended up here, uh, I, I was lucky in the 90s, a, a band I was in did quite well. And um, I ended up living in L.A., and that's where I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. And I thought uh, I thought that it was fantastic, but there was so much God in in the room mm-hmm. in terms of the steps and everything. And also, I didn't feel that I could stop um, just on the basis of meetings or whatever. And that was in about 1998. Um, it was a musician's, I think it was called the Musician's Picnic, or it's something to do with that group in North Hollywood. But it was mm-hmm. a fantastic introduction to AA. And then I ended up back in London in the summer of 2000, early summer of 2000, just really, really desperate. And um, went back to an AA group in North London where I met a very kind group of people who, uh, you know, helped me helped me get sober. And I got a sponsor there. And uh, I was uh, immediately grateful because I'd, I'd, I'd been a sort of a daily drink because I was immediately grateful to to find sobriety took me a while took me a month of daily meetings before I could stop Uh, but I that was the sort of August 2000 and I jumped in with both feet and I had a very active sponsor who was a wonderful guy still is and um, I, I wasn't in one of the hardcore groups but I think he'd at one time been sponsored by someone who was from one of those hardcore groups and that was certainly um what i believe was working for me and okay. that's that's the sort of the the fellowship member that i became and i, and I still am grateful to aa for and when you say uh, hardcore because i when i was reading your site yeah. you were a big you read the big book you knew the big book i know uh, yeah i mm-hmm. and also i loved um speaker tapes when i was so it was tapes and then cds and now sites like xa speakers and one of the interesting things about having my blog is I got contacted from people all around the world and, and I tried to make it as neutral as possible so it's not an anti-AA blog. It's mm-hmm. a sort of a pro-choice blog. And I get contact, I, I've been contacted by someone from um, Iceland or wherever it is where they're from, Finland, who knows those guys on, on the big XA speaker tape site. And um, so it's interesting to learn about the backstory of that kind of thing as well. But I knew, like, I, I, this is how AA I was, right? I went to uh, I went to Stepping Stones, I went to Akron, I went to the <laughs> hotel in Akron, and yeah, I, I did that I too. <laughs> called my sponsor from the payphone in the lobby, which is not the original the, the lobby that Bill was in. Um, right. And and then I went to Clancy's group, the Pacific group. I met that guy about three or four times. He was a, a fantastic influence. Um, so I did the whole AA tourism thing. Went to Doctor Bob's house the day after. The day after Ozzy Osbourne had been there, they were all buzzing because <laughs> And then my my sort of 
crowning glory as, <laughs> as an AA tourist was I went to Clinton Street in Brooklyn mm. and some, it had just been bought by a guy who was renovating it and I don't think they knew the history of the house. The builders certainly didn't. And I took a piece of floorboard from a skip outside the house and brought it home. And it was an original piece of floorboard because it's got a 1930s nail in it. Oh, interesting. A uh, big square-headed nail. And I, I put it on my mantelpiece and then I noticed that it had bits of dust all over it. So I cleaned mm-hmm. it and then put it back. And then this, this like dust reappeared. And I realized afterwards, shortly afterwards, I'd brought woodworm from the floorboard in, in the house where Bill got sober in Clinton Street <laughs> back to my home in, in Brighton in England. So I was, I love, I mean, I, I really, really did love it. And um, mm-hmm. there's a lot about it that I, I think is extremely positive. And I, mm-hmm. I sort of sponsored people and did all that. And um, uh, yeah, really, really enjoyed it actually. Felt. Yeah, that that background is a lot like mine, and I can kind of see where I could have gone maybe the way that you went. Um, I was I went to a, a group where we read the big book, we underlined the big book, we I mean repeatedly read it. Um, we thought that we had to do it exactly as it was laid yeah. out there. Yeah. That was my kind of AA, and I tell you what, man, it's taken me a while to kind of get that out of my system. <laughs> you know, later on, maybe we can chat about that. But there's there is an element of um, <clears throat> the, the the thought reform element of AA. I've got yeah. really interested in, and um, I was certainly I was somebody who would who would often share about you know they, they criticize AA because it's brainwashing, and and I uh-huh. I would say you know my brain needed a good washing. And I think yeah. I think to some extent it did, but I also think now that um, it's that element of having a sacred text. I think yeah. sooner if you have a sacred, inviolable text, sooner or later you're going to get in trouble because things change. And um, yeah. and I think with the with the internet, uh, YouTube, and and blog sites, we're, we're at a moment in history where things are changing in much the same way. They were when the when the, the Gutenberg Bible was was printed, were the first mm. sort of movable type, and that revolutionised how how the word of the Bible could get around, and people didn't have to handwrite them anymore. And mm-hmm. um, I think we're in a similar kind of information age, uh, obviously. Uh, but it's changing. It's meaning that any, any organisation with a sacred text, particularly. A newer organization, like, I mean, obvious examples would be Scientology, which is falling apart, um, or, or formerly reasonably respectable churches like the Mormons or the J- JWs. They're all in big trouble now because cause their text, their sacred text has been challenged. And I think that this is why this is interesting for me as a somebody who was really, really heavily into AA and, and who believes it helped them a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and saved my life is that it, I do think that we, we're we're coming to towards a very interesting time. And the one thing I would say is I wish there had been AA Agnostica or AA Beyond Belief when I was trying to get sober, because uh, I wouldn't have had to have such a deep rock bottom. And um, I, I asked someone to sponsor me who who was a kind of a science guy because I, I thought as a guy involved in science won't won't be a, a god botherer and he was you know he he was and um to a certain extent and certainly encouraged me to to pray and all that sort of stuff and uh get a relationship with my higher power and if if sites like aa beyond belief and aa agnostica had been around when i was trying to get say but i probably would still be in aa i'd be i'd be in a sort of a, an activist atheist wing i think i wouldn't have had the probably the the jarring experiences that i had as as an atheist who who felt that they needed to have a spiritual awakening in order to find and maintain sobriety yeah it would have been a different deal for me too just having the internet yes <laughs> would have been it would have been uh, amazing back then because uh, you know back then all i knew you know I, I knew that aa was a place to go because i used to read dear abby in the newspaper yes. and she used to talk about aa was where you need to go if you have a drinking problem and as you mentioned on your blog just in popular culture you would see it in hill street blues you'd see it in movies and that type of thing so that was always in my mind that that's where you go if you have a problem with drinking i didn't know anything else and so that's where i went that's it. and and aa benefit has benefited greatly from that and also continues to do so because 
so many people are sober in AA. It's been so successful that um, lots of movie producers and scriptwriters and actors, as we know, are, 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 are sober in AA, which is great. But it, mm-hmm. my question is, when will the first popular soap opera character find sobriety in smart <laughs> recovery? Or yeah. when, when will somebody in a movie have difficulty with alcohol and find the Sinclair method? And, right. and on my blog, I think the argument I make, kind of tongue-in-cheek, because I know it's never going to happen, is that AA ought to – it benefits so so heavily from being first to market in the alcohol recovery issue, and it did so well so early on, <clears throat> that everybody knows you go to AA if you have a problem. And it would, I think, save a lot of lives if AA did a leaflet that was, you know, here are some other things you can try without necessarily endorsing them. Just, uh, you know, I thought that was an actually a very good point. Mm. Um, and I think that probably if if we would have had that kind of stuff in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous, they probably would have been very interested in mm. that, I would think. Mm. And they, they probably would. And it makes sense. Why wouldn't they want to let people know, hey, if this doesn't work, we say in our book that this isn't the only solution. Here's some other things you can try. Exactly. It, it, they should and 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 I was also thinking because it, it was you were writing about transparency AA transparency mm. why why wouldn't AA want to be in the in the dialogue and the conversation about recovery and you know participate fully it seems like they just they just they don't even want to participate in in that discussion it seems. It. and and it gets serious and it looks cult like when I don't know if you've seen um, Monica Richardson's movie. The third. Oh yeah, I, have. I mean, no, no, I haven't seen that. I have not seen it's that. It's available now on DVD, and obviously, there's the 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 in the, there's a, a lawyer who posted one of the AA Facebook chat rooms who did a, a brilliant analysis of that case. It's not all about the Car- Carla Brada case, but that's that's one of them, and he he did a brilliant analysis of that. And I don't I don't think that case was ever going to. Um, to to really amount to anything it's a terribly unfortunate thing to have happened but monica mm. monica was actually sober in aa for 35 years and and i think she's she's made the movie in good faith and she she goes to the headquarters in new york where i've also been i've been to that sort of friday morning meeting which I was i thought was a fantastic meeting there's people from all over the world there and um she's kicked out you know they won't even see her and they, really? they call security on her at the end of the movie. And it makes AA look look like a kind of shabby cultish organization, which it isn't. It's so not that. But because they won't engage in the dialogue, because we have, you know, cut, cutting edge mental health technology from the 1930s and cutting edge organizational technology from the 1940s, none of which can change. It means AA today won't engage in any dialogue. And um, as a result, it just, it just, uh, you can see why people are anti-AA. I'm not, and I don't. Right. I, 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 I strong. I get a lot of criticism from people that are genuinely anti-AA, and I'm glad that I do because it shows I'm in the right place. If if I'm upsetting hardcore steppers and I'm upsetting the the sort of anti-AA brigade, then I'm mm-hmm. kind of where I want to be. And um, but I think it's really unfortunate that the fellowship won't engage in dialogue in those issues whether it's the atheist issue or the issue of uh, safeguarding in the rooms and it's almost like once they accept they have to engage they accept there's an issue and then they feel they're going to become liable for actions that might result which there'll be more i'm sure but um yeah this is why i think it's an interesting time it's an interesting time because you and i can have this dialogue ourselves uh which we would never have been able to do 20 years ago that's absolutely right. You know, I about a couple of years ago, maybe maybe it's three years ago now. I finally concluded that you know I'm an atheist. I, there's nothing supernatural. Um, it was kind of a crisis for me in a way of now what do I do with AA? And I went on the internet and I found all this information. And I was at a place in my life where all my all my ideas were on the table. Yep. There, w- there was nothing that I held sacred anymore. And it was an exciting time, but it was also kind of a scary time uh, because, mm. you know, this is the, this is all I've known for so, so long. Yeah. But yeah, 
Did you find? Well, I wondered as, as someone in in recovery. It sounds like we had a similar experience, and I I've spent a lot of time avoiding uh, books that now I devour. Things like the God Delusion and and mm-hmm. Lawrence Krauss and the yeah. the Andy Thompson video that I linked to on my blog. Um, that that I found so powerful, and I spent uh, twelve years avoiding those and and having friends say to me yeah you really do don't want to read that that god delusion book because and i said well i can't because i'm sober on the basis of a loving higher power so i'm I'm just not going to read it and as someone who who prides himself a little bit in trying to be a critical thinker and a rationalist i feel i do feel slightly um that uh I'm grateful to be sober, but I do kind of wish I'd been a bit braver a bit earlier on and taken that step because it is a step into the void, isn't it? What was your? It is. Did you avoid those books, or did you? What was it that turned you? It's interesting. I, I think that well, I've never been a religious person to begin mm-hmm. with. I never grew up in any kind of religion, so I never really had any deep belief in one way or the other. In fact, when I got into AA, um, I just kind of rationalized all of the spiritual stuff, thinking that okay, I'm going to do these things and I'm going to get some kind of psychological benefit from it. Yeah. So I tried to interpret it early on, but then what happened to me is I just kind of fell in line with what was going on, and I talked the talk, and people liked what I was saying. And I was doing well, I guess, you mm-hmm. know, um, and I, I, I kind of had blinders on. I wasn't I wasn't thinking outside the box of AA. And but my, I got married in 2006. My wife is an atheist. And I don't know if that really got me thinking or not, but I just gradually started having doubts. And I finally did pick up those books, mm-hmm. The God Delusion, God is Not Great, whatever. Yep. And that did do it for me mm-hmm. that 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 clinched the deal. And it was funny, I, I went to AA and I, I knew I was an atheist and I wouldn't tell anybody and I wouldn't let anybody know I read those books. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. But I, I, I mean, I, I, one of the interesting things for me is where you're based. And I know that I think a lot of the AA or some of the agnostica guys are in Canada. Mm-hmm. And obviously there's atheism in AA is much stronger in the UK. I think I was it was quite unusual for me to to get sort of a fairly religious spiritual sponsor but where you are i mean my heart goes out to you really because i get emails from the midwest all the time saying not all the time fairly regularly saying you know i'm an atheist in aa i'm sure you do and and i don't know what to do um and that must be really difficult for a lot of people i really feel for those people and i think that's why this movement is so very important and I think there must be a huge demand for it. I think there's a massive service that can be rendered here um, in, I think in what you're so. doing. I think that there will be a change. Um, here's the thing about AA here in, a, in the United States anyway. Most people that go to meetings, they're not really churchgoers. Mm. They're, not, they're not particularly religious people. But they've made, without really realizing it, because I did this, they've made AA their religion. Yeah. And so they're reluctant to do anything different with the program. They're mm-hmm. reluctant to want to change the big book or to talk about something outside of the the approved literature and that sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. But I think that that will begin to change. Um, it's already. I mean, I can already begin to see it as more of us come out in AA as atheists, and especially with these secular AA groups popping up all over the place. Um, you know, I have people come up to me and say, you know what, I, I'm an agnostic too. I just don't say anything about yeah. it. Or, you know, and I think that more people will come out and, and we will see some change. Do you think um, it's the case that a lot of the stronger characters in AA, in AA are the people that have great faith? I mean, that was why my sponsor and his friends, there was a little close group of people. They all had good, long, strong, solid sobriety. And it was based on the program and their faith and it was so beguiling and and persuasive to me that it wasn't really an issue it was like yeah we, you know i was desperate it was fine which way's mecca yeah. you know you tell me which way to point and that's that's the direction i'll pray in um because yeah. you're vulnerable like that when you hit a rock bottom you are you are and i was i was pretty young i was 25 years old mm. i was looking at maybe doing six months in jail mm. for a drunk driving offense wow. i didn't have a job i had no money and these people that had this deep faith 
they were so sure yeah. about it. And I've never, I've never been sure about anything in my life, yeah. but these people were absolutely convinced. I know now to be aware of that type of thing. If somebody is absolutely sure, you know, yeah. and <laughs> watch out for that person. <laughs> so have you ever sort of shared in a meeting that you, you, what happens if you share openly as an atheist in a, in a, in a meeting in the United States? Well, I'm a bit of a coward, I guess. What what I did, I, I, I was very reluctant to come out at my home group. Yeah. Um, in fact, I never really did until I, I was gone for a year and I went back. But I would, I think um, I read that. But you wrote a piece about that. Yeah, yeah, that was really yeah. moving. I thought it was great. That will come out tomorrow too. Yeah. But yeah, I, uh, I just, I, I, what I would do, I would interpret whatever was going on in the meeting, and I would, I would just share based upon my new outlook. And what would happen is people would very subtly put me in my place by quoting sections of the big book, you know, yep. and that type of thing. Yep. And I just began, I just started feeling uncomfortable. So rather than fight it, I went and started a group, uh, an agnostic group after learning about all of these things. And then I've met, you know, there's probably been, we probably have about a hundred people in our community now in Kansas city I that see. go to our meetings. And so I've got this, and, and now we have actually agnostic meetings here six days a week. So there's no need for me to go to any other meeting. So I don't really challenge myself. There, and there's been a few times, though, where I've gone to, like, in a rural area where um, they absolutely do not have anything. They don't, they don't like the atheism thing at all, yeah. and they were, they were directly kind of confrontational with me. Wow. But for the most part, I haven't really uh, gotten involved with that too much. And how about the, the, the other thing for me is that, um, I mean, I was a, a naturalist, and I think part of my drinking was the sort of an existential fear that comes around with that that sort of bleak outlook on life you know the the mind is what the brain does and there is nothing outside of uh the chemical soup that's that's in each of our skulls and that in itself has value for what it is and the, there's a value in truth and honesty and yeah. that seems to be the truth and to me an honest program is one that goes okay this is what life's about um, on on life on life's terms, as I've heard shared in the meetings a lot. So, what happened to you, John? Because you mentioned in your in your blog that you you are a naturalist. You've always mm. had this, but 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 then you went back to that. What happened that got you to go back to I, that? I I it was a strange combination of things. Uh, a few couple of years before I left, I I had um, something I said I'd never do, which was I had a relationship in the rooms, and that was weird. And then uh, I realized that I'd sort of been living in this kind of weird financial bubble where because I was so grateful to be sober every day and praying and, and letting God run my life, I'd kind of not really been taking care of other things that I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And then the cognitive dissonance of faith and prayer and going to meetings that I started to think weren't helpful and were actually starting to find quite painful um, just became overwhelming. And I ended up with this kind of OCD issue. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder for mm. me uh, was not helped by the steps. Um, yeah. The one element of OCD there's a, is called puro, which is obsessive thinking, pure obsession. And and that's kind of what alcoholism is as well. The, I, I see alcoholism and OCD as kind of the same thing. The AA definition of alcoholism is obsession and, and compulsion mm -hmm. in the form of the allergy, and um, and that's what came to start coming out in other behaviours. Just weird things like you know locking the door and switches and things like that, mm -hmm. and. Um, and the harder I worked the steps, and I worked steps real hard, the harder I worked at them, the worse it got. And it was mm -hmm. it was comical at first, and then it just yeah. became, it started to become seriously an interference. And I realized that um, after 12 years, this thing, just like with the drink, the thing I thought was holding me together, the one thing I thought, thought was keeping me together might possibly be the thing that I needed to take a break from. And so, um, so I stopped, I, I had a, a reverse spiritual awakening in a meeting mm -hmm. when I just realized it's, you don't want to be here and it's okay not to be here. 
And I told my best friend and he said, you, you're insane. This is crazy talk. And I said, you know what? I don't care if it is. I'm not coming back. And that was January, well, two years ago. And I haven't been back since then. And I did some CBT. I did group cognitive behavioral therapy for the OCD on the NHS. And, um, mm-hmm. and that was amazing because there was lots of things that happened in that group, like cross talk and cross sharing. And that, and it was, um, they had a group leader who was appointed, who was the, per, you know, the therapist in charge who was, um, who wouldn't give out the contact details, which mm-hmm. as most professionals don't and all kinds of new relationships, professional therapeutic relationships that I'd never seen before. Because I'd, I'd put all my faith in AA. I was one of those, you know, steps or solution to every problem in sobriety, all that kind of Mickey Bush ac- mm-hmm. AA acronym type stuff. And it just opened a whole load of conceptual doors for me. And um, it made it all okay or relatively okay. But the, the one thing, the, of course, the, the big R in it was I was losing my faith at the time. And that mm-hmm. was through step 11. And I read or took the Bart Ehrman's course. Bart Ehrman does a brilliant Mm -hmm. course on the great courses called The Historical Jesus. There's also, Mm -hmm. there's a book called On the Historicity of Jesus, I think, but his his course on the teaching company's great courses is called The Historical Jesus, and it's stunning. It's it's 24 lectures, and it just blew me away. And I thought, Mm -hmm. the Jesus of the Oxford group, these people who were trying to behave like first century Christians, is not the hit Jesus of history. Right. So that was kind of weird. And then I watched Andy Thompson's Why We Believe in God's Lecture, which I linked to on the blog. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that oh, out. Oh, man, I started watching that as someone of faith. And 45 minutes later, the YouTube video finished, and I was an atheist again. Wow. And it was stunning. And it's it's he says at the start, he says, you know, we, we, we're starting to collate all these different ideas about faith and where it comes from. He said, what, what I'm going to do here is present to you a, a basically a collection of ideas that encapsulate the psychology of belief as we understand it. And we, we now think we can explain belief in all its forms. All forms mm-hmm. of spirituality are part of this. And I started to realize, you know, Charles Darwin was either right or he was wrong. And if Charles Darwin was right, then everything we know is a consequence of this huge long-term evolution that we've been part of, including our consciousness, including our moral behavior, and including right. our sense of the spiritual. Right. And that, that so just took does, it apart from me. When you were doing CBT, was that just through uh, an independent psychologist? You, was that it was through SMART? On the, it was on the health service here. It was a national health service. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I'd gone to the doctor with because I was having trouble getting out of the house because I was so obsessive compulsive. I was locking the door 25 times. And oh, wow. he said, uh, okay, you know, and I was praying and ask, asking God to take it away, which is the worst thing you can do because religion itself is a form of OCD. Mm-hmm. If you think of prayer beads, that's, yep. that's OCD. That's counting Hail Marys. That is yep. absolute um, nailed on obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, or yep. like stepping. One of the questions they ask you is, as a child, did you try and avoid stepping on the cracks in the pavement? Did you count things? Did odd or even things make a difference to you? Uh, and that's how where it can develop from. So, so I, um, yeah, so I went to the doctor in this, in the UK. We have a NHS health service system, mm-hmm. and he said, if he said what he said, obviously you have a lot going on, but I think one of these things is is classic OCD. And we can get some cognitive behavior therapy for you in group because it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, I think that will help with all the other things you're suffering from. And the doctor, uh, his partner at the practice, they also said, you should leave AA. Yeah. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I can. And they said, no, you've done enough. I'd sponsored people. I had sponsors mm-hmm. who were over 10 years sober at the time. And they said, you've done enough. It's harming you go wow and and it was a doctor who told me to go 14 years previously and the doctor was now telling me to leave so i was like okay that book ends that neatly but i was one of those hardcore aas remember if you don't go yeah. aas like the mafia you leave <laughs> you leave you die and i right. genuinely left that's partly why i wrote the blog 
I genuinely left expecting to drink and die at some point. Right. Um, cause that's what the, that's what I, I, I really believed. And, um, fortunately haven't done. Yeah. Seriously. There's, <laughs> there's that component to it. When, when I, uh, was first learning about agnostic and atheist AA, I was shocked the very first time I heard somebody say, Oh, the steps are bullshit. I don't have anything to do with the steps. Mm. I was like, what, mm. what are you talking about? Because I, I was convinced that the steps had to be done, mm. that if I did not do those steps, I would drink. Yeah. And now I see the danger in that because I've been to meetings where people beat themselves yeah. up oh, yeah. because they're not using the damn steps yeah. the way they think they should do. And they're upset because they're depressed or whatever. Yeah. 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 And that's crazy talk. It really is. It and is. it's slightly culty as well. And it's weird because... In I see in in CBT the opposite is the case. You embrace the grey areas. There's no musts. The, all the yeah. there's a lot of musts in the big book that we, we we must do this or it kills us and that kind of black and white thinking. And I'm no expert on CBT. I did ten weeks of it and and try and you know did some reading on it. But uh, Albert Ellis had this great phrase. You know, sure Shayla should. Anything anything that says you should be doing something is something to be suspicious of. And and masturbation, uh, the the idea that you must be doing this or you must be doing that. Now, in AA, we do have one thing we mustn't do, which is drink, right? Right. But then beyond that, is there a, is there a kinder, gentler way, is it, or even an easier, softer way? I'm not sure because if it, the problem is if you challenge the sacred text, you're a pariah. Uh, yeah. And um, I'd kind of got to the point where I wanted, I just wanted to see what happened and. Uh, I thought, well, let's see what happens and do it. And um, I definitely didn't want to be in one of those anti-AA people. But I thought maybe no. there's a, mid, a helpful mid-ground. Because the, the other thing that happened is I think a lot of people go to AA and grow out of it and are and uh-huh. are okay. Yeah. I think that's the general experience of many people in recovery, actually. And it's yeah. not you don't hear that in the rooms. Um because what you hear in the rooms is people who buy into the notion that my disease is doing push-ups in the parking lot. Right. And they go out and they do relapse and they have a horrendous head full of AA, belly full of beer situation because that's what AA tells them will happen. Yeah. And, I, um, the great they strength come back of and AA. Tell you that. It, the thing about AA that they're good at, I guess, is they're more support. we're more supportive mm. than we are treatment yeah you know we're not there to fix anybody yeah but we're there to support each mm-hmm. other and if we look at it in that in that yeah. framework you know that's what's so beautiful about it and we're everywhere you know so when yeah. you're having a crisis in your life like i was i have somewhere i could go and people are glad to see me sure. so that's the great strength of it but then after you get in you know that's where i think those of us that are that are in aa today have to be kind of careful um, like, you know, we talk about the steps in our group, but I always kind of put a qualification on it. I say, you know, this is a great framework, but you know what? Don't worry about it. You're not going to get drunk if you don't do this mm. just right. Mm. You know, it's not a big deal. But the real strength of our group is that somebody who's having a hard time in their life can come in and they can, they can meet other people who've had a difficult time and no longer are. Yeah. But it's a good yeah. support. Yeah. And I, th- I think it's, um, I don't know what. What do you think will happen in terms of uh, the future? Do you think there's going to be a schism, or is it something that AA can learn to live with? I think it's well. AA is going to change when it's going to change for the better or the worse. Mm. And I think that I think that um, the people that work at general service office, I think they're kind of aware that there's a certain dogmatism um, in AA. Uh, that that, and I think that they were aware of that. Um, you know, they're not going to interfere with the groups and so forth. But I think that what's happening now with the growth of the agnostic AA movement is that we're talking in our meetings about things that you don't hear talked about in other meetings. Yeah. So in other words, like we have, we had a guy come to our meeting who talked about smart because wow. he went to a smart meeting. Yeah. He went to a smart meeting in DC and I think he even brought the workbook or something. Wow. And Yeah. And so we were open to talking about it there. You would never hear that at another AA meeting. No. But the thing is, we, we were saying, yeah, you know what you can do? 
you you can do AA and smart. Yeah. You can kind of do a mixed bag of things. And maybe that will be the direction that we go one day, that people will, when they're having their very initial crisis, will start going to AA and then learn about these other options. Because, you know, that's what they say in smart. They say you can do smart and AA. And that's what yeah. they say in life ring. You can do life ring and AA. And what I think the real test will be, uh, the Sinclair method, because I'm starting to learn of people that have got sober using the Sinclair method, mm-hmm. and that's not a program of abstinence. But eventually, they they kind of feel that they don't want to keep drinking anymore, and they find they find abstinence through through doing that. And that, that I think that would be the real test if 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 AA meetings ever say, okay, this is an option. Uh, or if the fellow, that is you know. interesting. Um, I learned about the Sinclair method. Oh boy! Shortly after I um, helped start this um, agnostic group, mm. and I watched the documentary as mm. well, and it was a real powerful thing. I even put it on. I had a little website for our group. I even put the, a link to the documentary on that website. But boy, it really got me thinking. It, actually, it made me kind of want to drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a part of me that still wants to drink, but it also made me aware that I am still afraid yeah. of drinking. You know, so I don't know if that's for me. But but what it did, it made me aware that um, naltrexone is out there, and it's used a little bit differently in the United States. Yeah. They do prescribe it here, but they prescribe it as a way to reduce the craving. Yeah. So anyway, I was at a meeting once and there was a guy there who was really having a hard time, you know, not taking that first drink. And I told him, I said, you know, talk to your doctor about naltrexone. So, you know, that's what I got from that documentary. I, I did recommend that. Well, that's great I, that that can happen, yeah. though. I mean, yeah. it's like we should be to me. I think we should be on the side of getting well, however. And we should also be honest enough to accept that that can happen through a variety of roots and if AA genuinely doesn't have a monopoly then uh, then we should admit that and and yeah and and I don't believe Bill was anywhere near as dogmatic as many of the current members are I think he would have been very interested in the Sinclair Sinclair method and may have actually tried he'd have been all over it and he um, you know he was we all know about the niacin campaign he launched and obviously the, the the other things he tried that's a sort of an open secret. So there's no question in my mind that, that Bill Wilson would have absolutely really wanted that explored, whether he did it or, or he recommended other people do it. I mean, I've not done it because I'm abstinent and, I'm, and I want right. to remain abstinent. But I know other people that have done extremely well on it. I've seen other people struggle with it, but I've seen, yeah. I've seen some people do very well, very, very quickly. And about right. 20% of people seem to be instant responders and they basically mm-hmm. just stop. That's amazing. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And you can't really go to a meeting and share that, you know, and that's the no. sort of the, that's the, the, you mentioned the power of the group and we know groups are very powerful and that's the, mm-hmm. I kind of now I view AA as a massive, do you know the Ash, is it the Ash, Ash, Ash group in group thinking experiment where they, they um, they draw a line on the wall and everybody in the group's in on it apart from one guy and they all pretend that the middle line is the longest one and 70% of people will agree with the group. Oh, really? Because they don't. And, and I kind of see AA as a massive ash control experiment whereby you go there thinking, this works for you, it's not going to work for me. And everybody goes, no, 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 this line's the longest line. It's the sober line. And after a while, you believe it yourself, and and you get sober. Yeah. And I love I love that. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But I also think, you know, it will be it might be useful if if AA or the people more people in it like you've done were more honest about where the success comes from, or if we commissioned some proper research into it. Right. Um, Based on, so, sorry. do you think that the Sinclair method is going to catch on? I mean, I don't know if it, I, I, in the documentary it said that they're not they're not prescribing it. They're not because uh, there's a lot of money being made off of the twelve steps and that type of thing. Mm. Do you think that's what's going on? I I don't know enough about it. Um, I think that it seems to me unfortunate that it's out of patent 
because no drug companies are making a load of money. Uh, that's right. You know, and that's the slightly unfortunate side of it. Um, if it was still in patent, there'd be doctors being approached by, you know, uh, sales reps with naltrexone pens and uh, every week and everybody would hear. I mean, the people I know in the UK that have got hold of it have really had to battle to get hold of it. Some have had to go private and pay hundreds of pounds for it. Um, so I think it will, and but I only want to me only if it works. If it works, right. then we need it out there, and it would be really nice if people got sober via the Sinclair method, and then felt they would like to be part of a sober community. Sure, if they could then be welcomed to AA because they have a desire to stop drinking, so they qualify. And I think this is a generational thing. I think maybe five or ten years from now, there'll be a few thousand people in meetings who got sober via the Sinclair Method sharing that openly and honestly, and then more people will do that. Possibly if that would something. have worked, my, my brother-in-law died from drinking, mm. and he, he there's no way he would ever respond to a 12-step treatment mm. program. You know, um, and here... We got him into the Salvation Army. He left like the very first day he was there. Mm. It was too much, you know, and then he was dead within a few days. But I and I remember I, when I learned about now Trexton, I thought to myself, I thought about him. I thought, wow, yeah. what would that have made a difference in his life? Yeah. That that pill was available, <laughs> you know, some doctor could have at least tried it. Yeah. In a way, if you think of it neutrally, it's a potential health scandal the fact that it's been available for so long and no one knows about it. And in a way, I, the success of AA is to some extent a blocking mechanism on progress. And that's to do with the AA way of thinking, which is, you know, the steps, the spirituality. Um, if AA was op more open-minded about other things... Um, without being afraid of turning into the Washingtonians, mm -hmm. um, the, the, surely there has to be a midline between what happened to the Washingtonians and and, and where AA is now. Um, surely that has to be possible. I kind of think of it as because in the UK there's not a massive demand for atheist AA meetings because mm -hmm. kind of loads of people are atheists in AA anyway. Yeah. I, I was kind of unlucky because my sponsor's a great guy, but unlucky in a sense that I. I went that route and um, I do think that, uh, you know, that, that but it's no coincidence that the, uh, there's a website called AA Cult Watch yeah. and they're, they're based in the UK because there's a little bit more open mindedness and sort of skepticism, perhaps we're, we're a secular nation now. Sure. So, but you know, also <laughs> the thing about the AA thing though, too, is I don't, my theory is it's, it's less about God and it's more about the dogmatism mm. of the program mm. itself. Mm. So I don't know, but do you have that in the UK where just people are just big book thumpers oh, yeah. and that type of thing? Oh yeah. We have the God stuff. We have the program stuff. And also what people in the UK are is they're busy bodies. So you'll have people in AA who are really not into the God and not even that into the program, but they see the traditions as, as this sort of inviolate, thing and and they really you know they enjoy telling people how they're breaking the traditions and so um i mean that was one of my questions for you actually that because i obviously have completely disregarded the the an anonymity tradition because uh -huh. that's kind of why because i'd left aa i felt i could sure. i wondered if it it sort of weakens my case amongst current aas or i know that when i was a member i would have just seen myself as as someone who ridden roughshod through those traditions it's the traditions that really i think people uphold even more than the steps in a lot of ways because they do yeah. mm -hmm. um we <laughs> people when they hear criticism mm. they're going to think that you're you're totally 100 percent anti-aa just simply because you criticize it because i get the same thing mm. If I dare say anything negative about the program, you know, pe people don't like hearing that. They think that I'm totally against program, but I love it. Mm -hmm. I love AA, 
you know so it's and i know that i know that you're not anti aa either in fact you, one of the very first things you say in your blog is hey if if aa works for you please keep going yeah. to meetings or you know if you need help please go it's a great place to go absolutely well that's good so, that's kind of why i put that first because i want people <laughs> to know <laughs> yeah but i kind of think that cuz the uk is in this kind of weird position of having a large aa population but also quite a skeptical group of people. Um, I kind of think of it as the, as the Beatles in the sixties, the Beatles mm -hmm. sold American African American music back to the United States right. because they didn't really know what they were doing with it. They didn't realize it was a race thing and, and that there were boundaries they were crossing. And, and also it was kind of like four cute kids with, with weird accents. And I wonder if atheists, Atheism in AA will come perhaps from Canada and from the UK, probably less from the UK because there isn't because everybody's kind of atheist anyway. So we don't have mm -hmm. atheist and AA meetings that much. But the it's no surprise to me that the as Canada seems to be quite a strong, uh, fast growing department for that uh, because it's kind of outside of that. American yeah, it's more secular yeah. than Canada's much more secular than the United mm. States is. And I, yeah. I find that interesting culturally. Um, but the, again, it's the, when you have a sacred text that I, I read up on thought reform and there's, there's a great book by Robert J. Lifton and he, he came up with eight criteria for thought reform and uh, you can map AA slogans against, against those things. So even mm -hmm. if you're not on the program, if you're in the group and you're spouting the slogans, you know, you're still in, you're still in there. And, yeah. and it's all that kind of stuff like the, the sacred science and the, um, all the, all those different ways of, which is obviously the 12 steps and the, uh, the in-group thinking, um, and all these different criteria that they, he, he was researching the, um, the brainwashing of prisoners during the Korean war who came back to America as communists. And he was kind of working out how that, how that happened. So I think we're at a point where we can explore a lot of that. That sort of the, you, you, it's interesting to me as a former AA to take Robert J. Lifton's book and apply his eight criteria of, of thought control milieu can milieu control is one of them. So that will be 90 mm. meetings in 90 days or keep coming back or meeting makers, make it, mm. um, the confession that will be step four and five and, uh, the loaded languages or the, the sort of AA sayings, which any in group has. And I think, mm -hmm. I think AA is a really interesting organization that's ripe for, for someone to genuinely study it in a sort of, um, in an informed way that's not looking at the, the spirituality. There's been lots of academic work on AA and how spirituality works in the steps, but to maybe to look at things like the group psychology mechanisms, the, the, the oxytocin, you know, all that kind of ritual and rep, rhythm and repetition in meetings and saying, saying chanting together and the, the handshakes mm -hmm. and the hugs and the, you know, hi John, thanks John. That's all oxytocin. Yeah. I thought that was God. The moment of silence at the start. I thought that was God entering the room. Yeah. And it's not. It's oxytocin. It's your yeah. brain chemicals going, okay, they have some trust hormone because you're amongst friends. It's really funny. Um, at our group, we, we, ish, we, we can't have anything to do with ritual. There was mm. one guy who wanted to open our meetings with a moment of silence, and we just could not. We almost did it because we, had, we thought no harm, but we – but we were kind of bothered by it. And we couldn't put our finger on what about that moment of silence bothered us. But I think it was, why are you pushing your moment of silence on me? You want, you go outside and you do your moment of silence if you want to do it. But why do we all have to do it together? I, that, that's, that that's is fantastic. Stuff. That is so good. Uh, I think that's a brilliant thing that that happens. And I, I, I would applaud that. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> it's happening more and more in these agnostic groups. Mm. What do you think of the secular AA thing? Do you think, are we any different than AA? Are we just as cultish? No, what I, from what I know, what I love about it is, is, is this is going on. The dialogue's happening. I can't have this dialogue with, with and I try on various, there's a great Facebook page called the Rowdy Rum that's got 11,000 members. And mm -hmm. I try and have this dialogue with, with formal AAs and they're just not interested 
they genuinely aren't interested. And then you find out, you know, they, they, they've, they've gone the whole hog and some of them are creationists and all kinds of stuff and you can yeah. understand why. And, and on the flip side, the fact that we're having this dialogue means everything the, because we can, because of technology, which goes back to the Gutenberg Bible thing and the role the Internet's playing mm. to change the way we interact. And because we're genuinely open-minded, it asks us, you know, how do I get sober, honest, open-minded and willing? And that's either correct or it's not. And if it's correct, we have to be honest and we have to say, OK, the naturalistic worldview does seem to be the one that's got the most intellectual integrity and the, is the most founded in reality. And we have to be open-minded to other ideas and we have to be willing to explore them. And and I think the atheist movement in AA is doing that. And if I'd found out about it before I left, I'm, <laughs> I might still yeah. be going. I might have started a, a, an atheist meeting, you know. But I I, uh, I I I would thoroughly support it. And I think everything you're doing is. Uh, and what I like about it is there's some people I know that sort of have a couple of friends online. Um, by the various Facebook groups who really know their AA, you know, there's yeah. a couple of, there's some brilliant writing on those websites, yeah, totally. as good as anywhere else, and it's yeah. because it's from that viewpoint of, okay, I haven't drunk the Kool Aid, but I, I recognise the value of this organisation, and I want to know what it's about, and here's some sort of genuinely, thoroughly researched history. Um, I think all of that stuff puts puts the atheism in AA movement in a very, very strong position at the moment and makes it extremely so interesting too. and a very positive time. And I always say there's never been a better time for anyone to try and find sobriety. There's so much great stuff online. There's, there's things like the Sinclair Method that might help okay. you, Smart, Life Ring, but also this wonderful movement of progressive AAs that are open-minded and willing to help you, what, whatever your situation. And um, well, you have well, it will be interesting to see if it if it can make a difference. I I'm kind of an idealist, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there is room in AA for change. I mean, there is a mechanism in place where if people got involved, they can get delegates to go to the general service conference to vote. You know, to do different things. You can you can have a new book written if you want exactly. to. You know, yeah. you you can change things. So. We'll see. I, I, I've, I would like to see. Um, I would like to see some literature written that's totally neutral on yeah, religion. Absolutely, and, and a pamphlet for a, a good pamphlet for atheists. I, I thought it would be a great idea to rewrite the book just from a naturalist viewpoint. Yeah. Why not? And one for women as well. God, the language in the book is so oh, I know. pejorative. <laughs> Why yeah. not? Do we want people to get sober or not? You know, you couldn't yeah. write an educational or medical textbook in that language today. You just wouldn't be allowed. So without, you don't have to get rid of the old book, but you, right. you could have a sort of um, a supplementary copy that just said this is what the this is what it's saying. But uh, part of my argument, I think, is that what ha tends to ha what happened to me in AA is I become I became increasingly neurotic, and um, in some ways the steps I'm not sure help with that. That's the bucket of crabs argument. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't need a lid on a bucket of crabs because they'll one tries to climb out, the other one will, will the others will pull it back in. Mm -hmm. And I reckon once I stopped going to meetings, well, I kind of recognise that, and um, I think that's another great strength of a more open-minded secular movement in AA. It it, it does recognise progress, and it's not based on that kind of fear. Uh, yeah, you, you know, I, I, you, when I was in the, the going to meetings for so long, I thought that I was open minded, but I but I truly really wasn't. And it, then I later realized, boy, all the stuff I'm saying, I, I don't even believe it. Mm -hmm. I don't even fucking believe what I'm mm -hmm. saying anymore. And I so I, I wasn't really being very honest. And I think there's a lot of people in the rooms today that although they might not be aware of it, maybe they are at a certain level. They know they really aren't being honest. They're yep. just saying crap that they know yep. they get approval from saying. That's it. Now, that doesn't happen in our meetings, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, but, That's the old know. kind of talking the talk and, and walking the walk element, yeah. isn't it? It's a real – it's a tough one because you, 
you know, you want to feel that you have a little bit of a little bit of uh, sorry, my computer's squeaking. That's all right. A little bit of self control and, and a, a little bit of safety and security in your sobriety. And um, I think somehow the 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 fear element that happens in a lot of a lot of the way that that because uh, it's the deadly disease, isn't it? It's a killer yeah, it's, illness. It's going to do yeah. bad things to you. Is there a way? Is there a way ultimately of approaching it without fit, genuinely without fear, and um, that doesn't involve yeah. faith? I mean, for, the weird thing is, faith historically and evolutionary does great things, you know, for fear. It does work. It's kind of a Bill was right in a lot of ways there. I'll have to read some of that. Some of the stuff that you put on your um, website is absolutely fascinating. I, 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 some of those books I've never heard of. I need to, I need to check some of that stuff out. Well, that's the weird thing. When you start talking to traditional full-on AAs about about evolutionary psychology and alcoholism, they just don't want to know. And mm-hmm. there's some amazing, like, there's some very, very convincing explanations now, like the drunken monkey thesis. It's stunning. I can't. It's ten years old that book. I can't believe it hasn't been better distributed. It's I think Adam Adam wrote common oh uh, what is it called I'm, common, common sense, sense drinking yeah. yeah 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 common sense recovery whatever anyway yeah. he's looking into evolu- he's really into evolution and he's kind of looking into ev- uh, writing something about oh incorporating the theory of evolution into our recovery right. and that type of thing right so it'll be interesting to see what he comes up with there's definitely a lot of links there in the way that, that we respond to sugars and alcohol and, and fruit, you know, ripe fruit. That's all that's happening, really. And also the, the fears. CBT taught me a lot about what where fear really comes from and anxiety. And um, I'd never I, – I thought it was defects of character. And now I don't, I don't believe in them. <laughs> yeah. You know. I need to look into that. There was something you wrote that I liked. You said like in the first 25 minutes, you learned that your mm. thoughts weren't feelings. That's right. or... You know, there's no distinction in AA between thoughts and feelings. Uh, the, 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 there's no, never in, t- in 2000 meetings have I ever heard anyone say, I'm having this feeling, but it's okay because there's a thinking solution to this. It's they're rolled mm-hmm. in together in AA. It's a thinking problem as well as a drinking mm-hmm. problem and a feeling yeah. problem. And and in CBT, the CBT I did, they're separated. You have a feeling, and then you have thoughts, and they 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 can be considered in very different ways because mm-hmm. they're different mental processes. And then you put the action in, and that was that was a revelation. And I'm no longer OCD. It's gone yeah. completely. My, well, that's really interesting. Today, laughing about how I couldn't remember whether or not I'd left the gas on, and I didn't care. <laughs> yeah, because you know, it was just a feeling, and and um, AA kind of encourages you to explore your feelings. Yeah, I think sometimes it's healthier to go. You know what? That's just body chemistry. What is a healthy thought process here? The yeah. science that you know. CBT came along in the 50s, and, and it's never going to be incorporated. When you have a sacred text from the 1930s, that's, it doesn't have room for, for anything else because it's, it's fixed in time in that respect. And it's, I'm going to explore that. I, I think, does Smart use CBT? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I, I would, I, I've been trying to find a Smart Meet. You know, in Brighton, in England, there's 50, it's a small town, it's, it's a very recovered town. There's over 50 AA meetings and there's one smart meeting. Wow. And that's kind of the, um, I suppose I've made, I've been trying to make the argument and I don't know whether or not it holds water, but what, what I suppose I'm trying to argue is the very success of AA is, is in some ways a blocking mechanism to progress in other areas in that mm-hmm. everybody knows you just go to AA and, and, uh, right. And a town like Brighton, it's only got a couple of hundred thousand people, and fifty plus meetings is a lot. In, 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 that's a lot, yeah, man. It is. And that's not including CA and WA and GA and NA and A, you know, all kinds of A's going on here. <laughs> um, and uh, the one smart meeting, and smart is yeah. smart is all addictions as well. So smart would in, incorporate mm. CA and NA and all those others. 
Um, and I don't. I think there are some challenges to the spread of smart in that they have a facilitator who has to be trained, which is a strength, right. but it also means that um, they're slower to spread, whereas the, one of the great strengths of AA is anyone can open a meeting at any time. I, I, you know, I would love it if there were AA CBT meetings. I think that would be great. Because Bill, as we were talking earlier, he was he was reasonably open-minded about this stuff and made that oh, yeah. fantastic statement in 1965, which I think is in the uh, the grapevine, where he said, you know, any form of therapy is fine, anything. We just we should be completely open minded on this, and um, you don't hear that quoted in the rooms a lot. It would be a great yeah. opening statement. It's on. I'm sure it's um, available. He he made it in a speech and then he put it in the grapevine. But of course, he'd handed over control of AA by then, so it didn't really yeah make any. You know, I guess for a traditionalist, you think well, that's why AA is independent in order to protect itself from people like Bill and what he you know how he ended up thinking about stuff. Right. Um, but I definitely agree I, with you. I don't know how you feel. I'm going to look into it. Um, I read a book. I, I talk about this book a lot, but as uh, if it works, if you were, mm. if you work it, it works mm. something like that. It's Dr. Joseph mm. Nowinski. Anyway, he wrote about um, a research project called project match. Mm. And they investigated all these different types. Uh, they studied all these different types of treatment, and CBT was one of them. And it was effective treatment. Twelve-step facilitation was effective. Mm. But what he found was, the study d- determined was, it's not like a one-size-fits-all approach. That some people respond better to this, yeah. some people respond better to that. A combination of the two. So I can see how you could probably incorporate some of that. I have to learn about it mm. to see how how it would be done, but but I bet you you, you probably could. And I th- I just think it's going to take a long time because if you do talk to AA traditionalists like the guys I talk to on Facebook, they are so against it. They are they will walk over hot coals to uh, to to avoid any kind of progressiveness. Or oh what yeah, they would see as pollution, and I would have said the same. You know. To, couple of years ago i'd have been one of those people myself um so that's kind of the interest to me it's a very aa is a kind of a very interesting case study of the power of digital technology to Mm -hmm. change the way we think and the way we communicate and it's interesting because it's not you know there are there are some fairly brutal cults out there and some weird religious organizations that are suffering because of this huge openness of information yeah. Um, AA is there's not one of those. AA is a, it's a helpful organization yeah. that engages in thought reform in a helpful way, yeah. uh, in a useful, necessary way. Um, <laughs> and But at the same time, it's facing these same dilemmas. And that's why it's really interesting, because if, if Scientology falls over, you know, that will be something to celebrate. We don't want AA to fall over or would like AA to be stronger and one of a, a, a range of alternatives that people right. have so maybe someone might do smart recovery for a few years and then get into aa or do aa right. and then go into smart or or whatever if someone needs to take naltrexone and and then finds recovery in aa that's fine surely right surely because it the sensible thing is let's help people get well and um yep that's kind of where it, I think in that respect we're probably on the same page and I think absolutely yep hopefully and I think that I think that us atheists and agnostics I think we have an advantage on the um, technology front a little bit I I don't know what the other guys are doing but I I have looked (laughs) at some of those fundamentalist sites and they don't seem to be quite as uh, interesting as ours so (laughs) no and and also you got to remember that this is a generational thing in that most young people today are people who don't have share the same ideas about faith that oh yeah that people you know did 20 or 30 years ago so they just had a statistic at harvard whereby there are as many atheists in this year's harvard intake as there are catholics or protestant oh yeah students. yeah and that's you know yeah and i also think it goes back to that thing at the start it's this thing's about truth mm-hmm. and being honest and mm-hmm. and this kind of fake it till you make it to me is is helpful in one respect but also 
Um, I I think truth in recovery is really important, and honesty is really important, and self honesty. Yep. And you know, you could have said to it, someone who's an atheist, like maybe you or I, when we got mm-hmm. sober, just try the God thing and see how it goes. But let that little chink of light into your life and see what happens, which is what I did. I had a spiritual awakening as described in Appendix 2. But I don't, I don't think you could say that today to someone who's read The God Delusion and, right. and you know, Richard Krauss and all all, the, all those other brilliant people, Dan Dennett. If you if someone came along who, who'd read that, where, where are they going to go? The 25-year-old today in, in the year 2015 uh, is not reading Dear Abby anymore yeah. and getting their information that way. Yeah. They're getting on the internet. Yeah. And they get to read all kinds of stuff about AA that I never would have known about before I got here. So, you know, there's a lot of people in my old home group. um, You don't see a lot of young people coming in there anymore. Mm. You just see a bunch of guys sitting around getting old together. Mm. At our group, we're getting young people come in Mm. who wouldn't go to AA otherwise. Yeah. And they find us on the Internet. Yeah. So. And that's why I think AA Agnostica and AA Beyond Belief are really important. I think I, I think that I I'm not just saying this. <laughs> oh, I you. I honestly think websites have the power to be hugely influential culturally, and I was stunned at the quality of writing on AA Agnostica and on. Uh, oh, amazing! I I was I thought okay, it's another AA related site. Let's have a look at it, and you click on those articles, and it's stuff, incredible. The, 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 Bob K. Yeah, I Steve didn't want to K, say it, but Bob you said C. it. Yeah. <laughs> All those guys, they're amazingly talented. Well, I have a kind of a running gag with, with Bob on the Facebook group that we're in. Yeah. So I didn't want to say it, but yeah. It, no. the guy, they, He's brilliant. Yeah. He really is. And 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 that stuff will live. And Roger, yeah. Roger C. Yeah, brilliant. It's amazing. And, and I don't know how he does it. I mean, the guy's a workhorse. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's just, he's out there now writing a new book, yeah. and he wants me to help him. I'm like, God damn, I don't have time for this. I don't know how you have time for this. But yeah, he's amazing. They're all amazing. Because the, yeah. the history is important too, and it's it's you know that that book, uh, the common common sense of uh, of common sense recovery. Uh, there's the common sense recovery, which is I think really really good. I, I got that. But the, there's an older one by Peabody. Oh yeah, sense drinking or whatever it's called, which is the, the one that was hugely influential on Bill. Right. But because it's a a secular program of recovery, it's never mentioned in AA. Everyone talks nope. about, you know, the the Oxford group and, and the, the spiritual history. But there was this text by yep. Richard Peabody or whatever he's called uh, with a secular program of recovery. And you read that and you can hear the language echoed, you know, mm-hmm. there's once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic stuff. Uh, it's not just William James. There, there was mm-hmm. a secularist who was influential in, in early AA. He's been forgotten. I remember reading about that. I don't know if it was in um, Ernest Kurtz's book or if I just read it in some website somewhere. I learned about that book, about mm. Peabody. But one of the books that Bill Wilson drew upon. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to get to, to get to, to sort of recapture, for me, the great strength of AA Agnostica is, is the brilliant history stuff that's on there. It is really interesting and it's mm-hmm. true. It's not, it's not just, you know, the, what, you know, there's a good, there's a very interesting, a parallel. Uh, uh, I had a conversation with Aaron Ra. Do you know that guy? Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. I, I did um, a thing on the the ramen podcast with him that will be out in January, I think. And um, one thing I forgot to say that's really interesting is is Ra had done this uh, lecture on the 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 idea of Yahweh as an air god. So the oh. Jehovah Yahweh. He's an air god. He's not. A, he's not an earth god or a fire god or a water god. He's a god of the sky, and you say his name every time you breathe. And it's it's about late Iron Age people not really understanding the biochemistry of oxygen and atmosphere and weather. And huh. um, and Bill Wilson's spiritual awakening on a mm-hmm. mountain top, right? The wind of the of the of the preachers. F- passing through him bill wilson had an air god yahweh style yeah and there's a real cultural echo in that i'm not saying he became uh-huh. he did later on consider catholicism but 
but there's a i'm interested in those kind of cultural link ups i don't think that was an accident that no. his, his grandfather i read this in bob k's writing i think uh-huh. his grandfather had had a similar mountain top yeah stuff. and i think as an atheist you bring a perspective to that that uh-huh. is really informed and I think many atheists like Aaron Ra and others in those various movements, they understand religion, particular religions, possibly even more than many practitioners of the religions do. Mm-hmm. Because they have a very interesting perspective. They're just interested in, in what it's about, what it's really about. And um, yeah, that was fascinating for me to imagine Bill's spiritual awakening, whether or not, whether or not he was on the bell, Belladonna cure is up for debate, but he certainly had an, a, an, an air god mountaintop wind of the spirit passing through a moment and there's right. a huge cultural link there um yep so that you know all of that stuff i think there's a long way to go with it in terms of explanations and uh the future's i think pretty bright in that respect yep i agree hope so anyway <laughs> yeah well, John, this was a lot of fun. I will have to talk again sometime. I learned so much from you. I'm going to read some of that material that's on your site. Yeah. So, yeah, I really enjoyed this. And thank you for the, the what you're doing as well. I think it's really important. I really do. You know, it's so – I think our experience of going to AA – and the, the, to me, for me, there are two reasons why people don't get it. One's the God bit, and yeah. the other one is that they can't sustain abstinence. And I think what, what you're doing – is so helpful for anybody who's in AA and struggling with the God bit. They can come here and they can find relief from that. And I think that's, I really, really do applaud you for that. I think it's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, Yeah. Well done. And you have a Merry Christmas. Yeah, you too. Thank you for the the chat. (laughs) Take care. Cheers, John. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of AA Beyond Belief podcast. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, have yourself a very Merry Christmas.